Greetings to your friends. It's gospel broadcast time once again. It is my joy to be able to open this blessed book and tell people what it is it says. I'm not telling people what I think it says. I'm not opening up the Bible and giving my version of it. I'm opening up the Bible and telling you what the Bible says. You really don't need a lot of help. I run into people all the time who say, well, I just didn't understand that, and I had to go looking up the answer. Dear friend, the Bible will explain itself. If you'll read the Bible and trust the Holy Spirit, you'll always know what it's saying. You'll always know what it's all about. And I praise God that the Lord fixed it like that. He didn't fix it so people wouldn't understand it. And that's especially so in this dispensation of grace. Grace is easily understood. Because everything a human being needs is finished. It's done. It's over. You don't have to believe for God to do it. You just need to believe for God to do it for you. And how that happens is that you believe that everything that is said, like in Paul's epistles, is said to you. If you'll read your Bible like that, you won't have any trouble understanding it. People who spend all their time in the scriptures trying to make it hard on folks to understand it or trying to make a little money. They figure out, I, I, I can write this down and then I can explain it and I can keep on explaining it and I might even, even use ten others to try to explain it. And by the time they get to, you know better off. But if you had the Holy Spirit helping you to study and to read the Word, what a wonderful time and thing that would be. I'm studying right now in Romans chapter 5. We're going to talk about Romans chapters 5, 6, 7, and 8. And we've been some time now in chapter 5, and we've still got a long way to go. But we're at the 12th, we're at the 15th verse, I believe it is, yes. The 15th verse reads, But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. Now this is a one-man chapter. At least twelve times the word one, O-N-E, is used in this chapter, stating that the world got into its big mess when Adam decided to listen to the devil. That's why the world's in a big mess today. People are listening to the devil. It's not hard to understand that. People think they're doing the right thing, but if it isn't the word of God, they're going to get it from the devil. In fact, the devil right in the presence of God said, I can make you gods if you'll do it my way. And so people still have that idea in their mind. They got the idea in their mind that if I do it my way, I've been so smart, I'm so highly educated, I'm an intelligent person, and I'm a really a good person. If I just do it my way, I'll be better off. Impossible. Human beings cannot work it out their way. They can't work it out with the mind they now have. They need another mind. I hear Paul say, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. And so our 15th verse begins in the first line by saying, but not as the offense, so also is the free gift. (coughs) One man got us into trouble. One man, Adam. He got us into trouble. He brought his curse upon us so that every person that comes into this world has Adam's curse curse in them. That's a sin you can't work out. That's the sin you can't do anything about. That's the sin that is in the control of God. And the only way you can get free of that sin is to believe on the Christ who died on the cross. Because a major thing that happened on the cross was that Jesus died to get rid of Adam's sin. What really was Adam's sin? Seemed like a nice fella. He didn't know he was getting into such trouble listening to the devil. But he did. And the worst sin that the devil still makes today is making people think that within themselves they can save themselves. They can work it all out if they just 
give it a little more time and listen to all the people around them, evil people probably, you'll work it out. That's what the devil wants. He wants you to take your good and turn it into evil. I like to get into a subject like this because it is my feeling that most of this world that does not accept Jesus as their personal Savior have the same problem Adam had. Adam and Eve took a look at the devil, then in the form of a snake, and they said, this is the prettiest thing in the garden. This is the nicest thing in the garden. He's a talking snake. And so he's just telling us what he feels. And you know, it sounds all right to me. I'm running into people all the time, wherever I go, say, well, I like so-and-so on the TV. I like so-and-so on the radio. I like to go down here to this Mecca church. I, I like to hear what they got to say. I don't necessarily believe all the thing they have to say, but I'd like to hear about it. So Adam and Eve must have gone through that same process. They thought, well, uh, the devil's pretty smart, and he's made us a better offer than God has. God wants to give us this garden. The devil would like to give us a whole new way of living. We would be our own gods. Our own gods. So many people come to me and say, why is it the world isn't accepting Jesus Christ when that's the only way? The only book that's written that goes back that far tells us about Jesus Christ. You can't get away from Jesus Christ. You're going to have to do something with Jesus Christ. People don't like that. They want to think, well, I'm pretty smart myself. I got things pretty well under control. I made a lot of money. I, 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 I'm a millionaire. I'm somebody in the ranks of my business. You see, if you listen to the devil, he'll misuse every good thing you have. He'll take it and say, that's good, that's good. Oh, I'm, I'm so glad God made you like that. I'm so glad, glad that, that you're created by God. Uh, now then, I'd just like to tell you how you can use that a little better. I'd like to see you turn it over to me, if you will, and we'll take this thing God has made, the human being, and we'll use it. We'll use it in a greater way than it's ever been used before. And so people are tricked by one man, by one man to be something within themselves. That's really what it's all up to. The Apostle Paul wrote many different things in his epistles. But when he got to his prison epistles, he had a tune of what was really in God's mind when God chose the Apostle Paul. He didn't choose Paul because he's the most educated man in the Scriptures, probably. He didn't choose Paul because he was just outstanding. He, he wasn't like one of the fishermen that Jesus had to use. He was somebody that had done something. He had been a rabbi. He had been a high student in Judaism. And he had been out trying to destroy followers of Jesus Christ, which was a very notable thing to the, the Judas to that day. But you know, whatever reason people have to follow the devil is bad. It's not a good reason. Because Satan has only one objective, and that is to make you smart enough to like yourself enough to make yourself somebody. That's why these prison epistles of Paul are so very important because they tear down us. They tear us apart. It is not us that lives anymore. It's Christ that lives. I'm not somebody big and great anymore. It's Christ who lives in me. On it goes. God has used Paul's epistles, especially his prison epistles, to tell us what a Christian is, the way a Christian ought to live. And that's very sad because the only church ever presented in the Scriptures, the only church ever presented in the Scriptures was the Christian church, church in Antioch and other places. It was a Christian church. Motivated by the Apostle Paul to whom God had given the final gospel. Today, it's all mixed up. 
Not only is the gospel commingled, which is the trick of Satan, outside of tricking people's minds and getting them to do something that makes man better and bigger, the next bad thing he does is to commingle the scriptures. He mixes them all up. He puts them all together in a very strange way. When I go and buy a Bible, I've got enough Bibles now and I don't think I'll ever have to buy another one. But when I get a hold of a Bible, there are certain things I want to check in it. I want to see in that Bible where and if Satan, in his glorious beauty, in his highest intelligence, got a hold of some people that were changing the Bible, changing the Scriptures. So I go to Scriptures like Galatians 2.20. Galatians 2.20 says, I'm crucified with Christ. I'm killed, but I still live because the part of me that's killed is that part that was influenced by Adam. But I still live, the next line says. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Now that's God's plan. That's not church plan. That's not somebody's idea that came up with and they just inserted it in the, in the scriptures. That's God's final gospel. That human beings cannot be trusted with their own life. They must have another life in order to please God. Well, you say that sure does lower the rest of us, doesn't it? Yep, sure does. You know why God did that? And why he's doing it by the thousands today, leading them to Jesus Christ as the life of the human being on this earth. You know why he's doing that today? It's because the greatest, the most powerful, the most notable kings, priests, queens, all sorts of the greatest nobility that has ever been on this earth in a period of over 4,000 years of the Old Testament, was given a chance to be what God wanted them to be. But they never got it out of their mind that they could do something within themselves and be a little bit better. Take David, the great psalmist, beautiful psalms he wrote, probably under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But he couldn't be trusted with the message that Paul had today. He was a murderer. He was an adulterer. He went the way of the world. He came back to God. He was great in the end. But how could he be trusted with this grand and glorious message? So in this fifth chapter, we have one man represented by Adam. We have one other man represented by Jesus Christ. And that's what it's going to take for a person to get out of the sin and the shame that they're now in. They've got to have a radical change. God could not get what he needed from the greatest there were in the Old Testament. Even Abraham, for whom many in the New Testament claim as father of faith, not some people think he's the father of humanity. He is not. Adam, uh, Abraham is not the father of humanity. He's the father of faith. That special kind of faith, trust in God. But even with his great knowledge about trust in God and the great ability he had to creep things by his faith, he was a miserable failure. He should have gone into Canaan's land. He should have gone where God told him to go. He should have done what God wanted him to do. But instead he didn't do it. He rebelled against God. One of the greatest ones in the Bible, Abraham. Now, how does God fix that? He only had one son that pleased him. He only had one son that could be in human beings as their life. The son life comes from the father. How that works, I don't know. But the Son life comes from the Father so that Christ has all of the principles, ideas, 
truth in him. And when we accept Christ as our Lord and Savior, that same Jesus comes to live in us and pushes out our way of doing things. Now, he doesn't kill us in operations of daily living and so forth. He just wants our daily walk to be filled with Christ. But the reason that he put Christ in us was because the Old Testament saints could not be trusted with God's message. It took 4,000 years till God decided the time has come to make the change. What change was God going to make? He was going to make the change from what was going on to what was he doing in the first place. Only two verses of Scripture tell us what he did before he created this world. And before he created this world, he had an idea what he wanted in it. The kind of human beings he wanted to live in it. The kind of human beings that could be happy in a world that he had fixed with so many glorious features. That was how much God loved his son. So when Christ died on the cross, God had the liberty to place that son from that moment on in every believing soul. That's why our message is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Believe on him. Believe what he did. Believe what he did for us. Believe how he did it. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. I got to get it back on this, and so I will on the next broadcast. May God bless you and give you a wonderful, happy day. Because if you're a born again Christian, you already have Christ in you. I'm just bringing a message how you must begin to use Him and let Him use you. Because that's what God's intention is. See you next time. Bye bye.